It's really good to be with you all. I love the energy in this space. You all are a talented group of musicians. Thank you. And uh, I'm really grateful for your children's ministry as well because our four and two year old are in there and they haven't, we haven't been here for a while, maybe even like a year or more and they, they were comfortable when they got here. So thank you for having an open welcoming space for our kiddos this morning. I give God thanks for that too. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, his third chapter, and uh, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We give thanks for the reading, hearing, and understanding of God's word this morning. Thanks be to God. Amen. So my regular ministry job is at Resurrection, uh, and I, I uh, relate to all of our locations throughout the metro area, and I oversee a ministry that makes sure our frail and elderly congregation members are connected to the church still on a regular basis. So I'm talking about people primarily that cannot get to a physical location for worship anymore. So homebound folks and people that live in nursing homes and that sort of thing. So as you can imagine, sometimes in a church as big as Resurrection, we have some siloed ministries that happened, right? We have like children and youth and then older adults. And, and sometimes I think there are uh, certain phenomenons in churches where age groups get left out or forgotten about. And I followed a, a pretty beloved person in that position and some structural reorganization. And so it just took me a while. I'm at three years now in that position. And it just took me a while, it felt like, to kind of get my feet underneath me and, and talk to my colleagues about how important it is, the work that we do, our ministry specifically in nursing homes. We take about 25 worship services a month out to different care, uh, communities and make sure people get worship in their location and oversee a care list of 250 people. You know, it just took a while for that to be seen, I think, as something that valuable by some of my colleagues. But last spring, praise God, our uh, small groups pastor at Resurrection, I think finally kind of heard my pleas of intergenerational and valuing the program I oversee. And he invited me to be a part of a panel during Lent. 
okay? During that season where we think about Jesus being in the wilderness and the 40 days leading up to Easter and what they were talking about was spiritual disciplines and how they could kind of uh, practice the same things that Jesus practiced in that desert moment with the devil in those temptation moments, right? So they had one week on fasting and they had one week on prayer. And Pastor Justin called me up and he said, we would love for you to be on the panel the week that we talk about memorizing scripture. Because you'll remember that um, in the wilderness, in that story, right, uh, Satan comes to Jesus and says, you can have all these earthly kingdoms it'll all be yours. And what does Jesus do? Quotes memorized Torah, right? Hebrew scripture that he had inside of him from his years growing up in the Jewish tradition, quotes that memorized scripture back to Satan in that moment. So Pastor Justin said, we really feel like the work you do with our older population values memorization because you are all Always reminding us in meetings and, and interactions with your fellow colleagues that, you know, you can go through an entire worship service in a memory care unit, people with dementia, advanced late stage Alzheimer's, and they might not know their name, they might not know their family's faces, but when we pray the Lord's Prayer, they know it. They know the Lord's Prayer. They say it along with us. Every month, I, I have an argument with God in my office when I write our monthly worship service because I say, we can't possibly sing Amazing Grace again. We just sang it last week, right? And after years of serving in the local church where I had to pick different hymns and different songs every week or someone would call me out on picking the same one week after week, it's really hard for me to go, oh, but we have to sing Amazing Grace again this month, right? Because there's just a comfort for our friends with those memory loss issues that comes for those words. So I was really excited. I, I said, absolutely, Pastor Justin, sign me up. I'll be on your panel. I'm excited to talk about how memorizing scripture can be a spiritual discipline. And we can all get together that night. And surely God will give me something brilliant to say, right? And so I hang up the phone and I kind of have that moment of, what did I just say yes to? Because guess what I'm not good at? Memorizing scripture. <laughs> Anybody good at memorizing scripture? It's hard. Mem and I wasn't good at like memorizing uh, things in school either. That wasn't my deal. Flashcards, like I've just never really been a strong memorizer. Now, ask my husband who's here in the front row. I have a pretty good long-term memory about things that maybe upset me, but um, <laughs> short-term memorization has never really been my strong suit. So I thought, oh my goodness, what, like where do I even start? And so I thought, okay, what do I have memorized? Because Pastor Justin kind of said, you know, what we want you to talk about is what do you see these people that you serve in your ministry kind of um, call upon? What are their memories that kind of help them in this, in this hard time? And so we wonder, you know, like there's going to be a moment where I'm going to ask you, what do you call upon in your hard times? And I racked my brain and racked my brain and I just couldn't, having grown up in the church, I just couldn't quite place my hand, uh, my finger on something that I could come to the panel with that night. Now that gets better and I get there eventually. Later in the story, I'll get there. But the first thing that came to my mind was a little jingle that I learned in second grade about a certain crime dog named Scruff McGruff. Anybody else? Scruff McGruff, Chicago, Illinois, 60652. Did you learn about Scruff McGruff? Okay, well, anyway, we did in my little school, and he taught us about stranger danger and, you know, looking both ways before he crossed the street and all those things. So that was something that I was able to kind of like pull out of my head. And then I remember in sixth or seventh grade memorizing a little song about the helping verbs. Is, am, are, was, were, be, being, been, has, have, had, do, does, did, shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can, could. Hey, she's doing it back there with me. She knows it. So I had some stuff memorized, but I was hard-pressed to find something 
scripture wise. And so I started to panic a bit and pray and think, what do I have to share with my colleagues and with this gathering of people that are going to be looking to me for spiritual wisdom on memorization? So as we gathered as a panel about 30 minutes before that evening, Pastor Justin invited each one of us, and there were four or five of us on the panel that night. He invited us to think about what scriptures have kind of been like our life verses or scriptures that seem to just like come up every stage of life for us, right? And that finally that night, I'm not kidding, 30 minutes before the panel, it clicked for me and I finally had an answer for a scripture verse that I had memorized. And it's Isaiah 43, when you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the waters, they will not burn you. They will not consume you. That was read at my baptism, I learned. uh, I was baptized as an infant in the United Methodist tradition, so I learned later on in life that that was actually read in my baptism. I found a bulletin, and it was in there. Uh, It was my confirmation verse. It was read at my ordination. It was definitely like a life shape verse. So when Pastor, you know, Robert, or Pastor Justin asked um, Robert and Cheryl and I, what are your life verses? What are the ones you have memorized? I was able to rattle that off, right? I was pretty excited that I had something to offer to the the, um, panel at that moment. But so did all my other colleagues. And so uh, Pastor Cheryl, I think, probably uh, quoted Philippians 4, do not worry about things. Um, that one, and then I think Pastor Robert went to Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? You know that one. So we all had kind of our own uh, scripture verse that we were able to talk about that's kind of shaped us and formed us and gotten us through hard times in our lives. And as I've reflected on that panel, and I've not done this follow-up work yet, and that's too bad. I I need to do this follow-up work with my colleagues because I'm really curious. I have a theory, and it's the theory that I'm going to preach to you today. I have a theory that the reason why John 3.16 was not named as a life verse for any of them was because that that verse, that scripture has a bit of baggage around it, right? John 3.16, what'd you think, honestly, this morning when you came in and saw that the scripture verse was John 3.16 this morning? What'd you feel inside of you when I said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son? What'd you think about? What images came to mind? Because this is a pretty pertinent, pretty common verse that we see a lot out in the world, right? We see it a lot. We see it used um, out there a lot. In many circles, it's kind of become a shorthand for our faith. We think we see it and we are like, all right, that sums it all up. People will carry signs to sporting events that say John 316. You get some personalized license plates sometimes that say John 316. Uh, Did you know that the famous California burger chain, In and Out, puts 316 on the bottom of their cups? John 316 is printed on the bottom of their cups. The first is so famous that when you say it, everyone knows what you're talking about, everyone knows what you mean, and surely we're all on the same page about it, right? As followers of Jesus? Hmm. Do we all agree? (laughs) You're disciples. All right, yes. Certainly most Christians, all of us know it, right? We agree about what it says, but I wonder this morning with you, do we agree about what it means? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. For Christians who put John 3.16 on billboards and license plates and signs at sporting events, I wonder if sometimes this verse is used as a warning, maybe even a threat. Everyone who believes in Jesus. In other words, 
you had better believe in Jesus or else. Caroline Lewis, who's a Bible scholar and a John expert specifically, says this. John 3.16 has in our general parlance become that which justifies damnation for unbelievers. Yeah, God will save you if you believe in Jesus. But if you don't, good luck. And this is what happens when we take famous Bible verses and remove them from their bigger, larger context. When we read John 3.16 by itself, it sounds like a theological formula for salvation. Do this, get that. Believe in Jesus, go to heaven. Don't believe in Jesus, and you'll perish. But John 3.16 doesn't exist alone, in isolation. And we can't read John 3.16 without going on to the next verse, John 3.17. It goes like this, indeed, God did not send God's son into the world to condemn, but but, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God did not send the son into the world to condemn, And yet, that's exactly what John 3.16 is sometimes used to do. Too many Christians use it to condemn those who don't believe in Jesus or who don't believe in Jesus the right way, their way. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. God sent the Son into the world in order that the world might be saved through him. And the best possible illustration of that is the fact that this is part of Nicodemus's story. This verse is tucked into a story about a Pharisee named Nicodemus. A religious expert, Jesus says to him, are you a teacher of the law, he says to him, and you don't understand this? Someone who has it all figured out, right? But comes to Jesus in the quiet of the night, when no one else will see that he has questions, that he has doubts, when he can hide those things from other people. If we're going to use John 3 to come up with a theory of salvation, the conclusion that you come to should be the same one that Jesus helps Nicodemus come to in this story that God saves the whole world, not only believers. But even then, we might be missing a larger context. And ultimately, I don't think John 3.16 and 17 can be used to make an abstract theological argument, at least not without considering particulars, like that Nicodemus that I said, under the cover of darkness. And, and someone that just, Jesus hangs with him while he doesn't get it over and over again, right? So G- Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, what? I'm grown. I'm a grown man. So how am I supposed to be born again? And instead of dismissing him and say, get out of here, you're never going to get it. Jesus hangs with him in those questions and doubts, right? Here's the thing. God so loved the world. God loved Nicodemus, the Pharisee, that God sent the Son. The universal truth has to be seen through the particulars of this story. God loved Nicodemus, who didn't understand. God loved Nicodemus, who will return at the end of this story to help give Jesus a proper burial. Again, Jesus will have a conversation Earlier, no, excuse me, a chapter later in John, John 4, with a woman who's Samaritan. Now that one will happen in the heat and sun of the day because she also doesn't want to be seen by other people interacting with this man named Jesus. God loved the unnamed Samaritan woman just as much as God loved the Pharisee Nicodemus. And God sent the son to save both of them. John 3.16 and John 3.17, 
makes such a powerful theological statement today. Our faith cannot be separated from our real lives. And my goodness, if there was ever a time where our real lives of the political reality that we are living in, in this country today, cannot be separated by our faith in Jesus Christ. This is the moment. God so loved the world that God sent God's son for everyone that is running for political office. Everyone. Does that hurt a little? <laughs> Hurts me a little, not going to lie. Hard to admit sometimes. Wish it was up to me who God loved and who God does it, because I feel like I would know better, right? Because I want to love the people that agree with me, and I want to love the people that I can get along with, but the people whose views that I think are not in line with who God is, I wish God would maybe give up, and yet not. God so loved the world that God gave his only son for the entire world all of us loved your family and your friends, your neighbors, love the people who used to come to church but don't come anymore, love the people who were hurt by the church, love the people who have never darkened the door of a church, love the people who are hungry, love the people without a home, love the people who are sitting in nursing homes not knowing what their names are or who their family is. Loved our brothers and sisters who are Muslim and Buddhist and Jewish and Hindu and Sikh, and not on the provision that they will accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior one day, but just because. I often say that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the Wizard of Oz gospel. Because, 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 because God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Not if then, if we accept Jesus as our savior, then we will be saved. Nope, because God so loved the world. This isn't just about some abstract theological concept. It's personal, it's individual, it's real, it's concrete. When you quote John 3, 16 and 17, when you recite, when you see God so loved the world, remember with me that it's personal and it's universal. God loves the whole world. God loves you. And God saves all of it. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for who you are, how gracious how open, how loving you are to have sent your son into this world, this world that so desperately needs to know that there is hope and that there is a future with you. God, I pray that you would hold each person in this room right now Help them to know that they are loved, no matter how they come to this space today. If they're doubting, if they're confused, if they're hurt, if they're joyful, if they feel safe, God, help them to feel your love. And for those that are not in this space, those we maybe miss, our grief, sometimes is very heavy. And in this moment, I pray for those who are walking the road of learning what it means to be on this earth without a loved one. I pray your mercy upon them and your peace that will comfort them. God, I do pray for where we are as a country and a world right now, we need to know that you have good plans. We need to remember this day that you are working together for the good of all of it. And help us, Lord, help us to be the hands and feet of your son Jesus, to go out from this place and to share the love of Christ with all we meet. 
so that all might know that you, beca- you came because you love. In Jesus' name and by the power of your spirit, I pray. Amen.